It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's one of the most easily recognizable opening lines from any literary work, the book of Genesis, a book that's been interpreted in countless ways over the thousands of years of its existence. In this episode, we're speaking with an expert on the book of Genesis. It's part of the Maxwell Institute podcast's ongoing series on the lives of great religious book series. Ronald Hendel wrote the biography for Genesis. He's a highly acclaimed professor of Hebrew Bible and Jewish studies at the University of California, Berkeley. And he's also working on a project to produce a new critical edition of the Hebrew Bible. In this episode, Hendel offers a portrait of Genesis, its life, and the history of its interpretation. He writes, a text's afterlife inevitably affects one's reading of it today. Thanks for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. And as always, please take a moment to rate the show on iTunes and recommend it to your friends. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to me, Blair Hodges, at mipodcast at byu.edu. Welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast, Dr. Hendel. And the book we're talking about today is your biography of the book of Genesis. I thought we'd begin by talking a little bit about your academic background that led you to this particular project, and maybe a little bit about your religious background as well. Okay, well, I'm a professor of Hebrew Bible at University of California, Berkeley. I have a PhD in uh, Biblical History and Northwest Semitic Philology from Harvard University. So my approach is very academic. It's very much from a humanities-based perspective. Uh, It's the kind of discourse that goes on in the university. And what I'm trying to do in this book is to expand the traditional academic focus on the Hebrew Bible, on its um, to, to expand it to include its uh, history of reception, its history of interpretation. The text itself has a life, uh, and that life is not confined to the ancient world. That, wife, that life takes on all sorts of different forms as people have interpreted it uh, over what I call the lifetime of the book up to the present. How did you come to be selected to do this particular volume? Were you contacted by the publisher? or? Yeah, I've written a number of uh, books and articles on the book of Genesis. And uh, I think somebody was asked to do this book, and they said, no, they don't want to do it, but you should ask Handel. <laughs> so it's a, it's a hand-me-down. <laughs> so people know that I, I work on Genesis. Right. I mean, you're, you're also chief editor of what uh, used to be called the Oxford Hebrew Bible, and I, did they rename that recently? Yeah, we left Oxford University Press uh, so that we could do some more adventurous things uh, in our electronic version. Uh, So now we're with the Society of Biblical Literature, which is the main scholarly society in the field of uh, biblical studies. Yeah, so it'll be called the Hebrew Bible, a critical edition. The books will be published by the SBL, and the electronic version will be uh, free and open access and housed on their servers. One of the cool things about your book is the art that that was selected for this book. Can you kind of describe it and talk about where the art came from for, uh, for your book? Yeah, well, the publisher said, you can have some uh, artwork. And I said, well, gosh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, And I realized that uh, I have a a close friend who's a professor of Hebrew Bible at University of California, San Diego. His name is Bill Propp. He's one of the world's experts on the book of Exodus. But he also is an artist. And so I said, this is someone who would be a perfect person because he would understand what I'm doing in the book but he would also make these beautiful black and white uh, uh, line drawings, these beautiful prints uh, that illustrate the themes, the ideas in a creative way. And he just did these magnificent uh, ink drawings mm. that are, are at the head of each of the chapter. And each of them have a little quote from Genesis below it or from one of the interpretations of Genesis that his, his uh, artwork is exploring. Yeah, they're, they're very stark. It's just really beautiful uh, black yeah. and white art. Yeah, he did a gorgeous job. And they're very moving. It's very moving artwork in and of itself. My next question actually kind of gets to the heart of the overall series in which your book is situated. It's the Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. And, and you tackle this metaphor uh, uh, of doing a biography of a book in, mm-hmm. your, in your introduction. In, in what sense do you think we can say that a book is, is alive, is like a living thing? 
Yeah, well, the book of Genesis, I think, is a, a really prime example of a book whose life changes, it grows, it uh, takes different directions. Uh, and so the metaphor of something that's alive, I, I think, is quite nice uh, for this book. It has an original context, an original uh, author's audience, and so forth. But uh it grows in various ways in Western civilization, in Judaism, in Christianity, in uh, secular culture. Uh, and so the idea that is, it has a life, it's really a metaphor for the fact that it lives in Western culture in various ways. And so to trace that, that life and the t twists and turns that it takes really is a story about the life of Western culture. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you kind of, you, it seemed that you were saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that the book itself is given life in the relationship that it has to its readers. It's almost as though the book really can't be alive unless it's being engaged by, uh, by other living people. Yeah, well, it's a little bit like if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, did it really happen? Well, it, it certainly really happened, but it didn't have any relationship to people if no one was there to hear it. So the idea that the book has a life, but that life is only in the people who hear it, you know, it makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, so the, you know, the book has its own reality, just like the tree falling in the forest has its own reality. But it's but the real story is how it affects people and how it, how its effect on people has changed over time, and how people bring different things to their understanding of the book, uh, how the how people how the way people understand the world is influenced by the way they understand this book and vice versa. The way that people understand the book influences the way they understand the world. So, uh, so the metaphor is li of life, uh, of a book that has a biography, is uh, I think a fruitful metaphor because it allows you to connect all sorts of things uh, that you otherwise might not see the connections of. Are there any limitations to that metaphor, do you think, that are constrained as, as you kind of went through the project? Did you bump up against any unexpected walls thinking of it uh, in terms of a living thing? Well, the only – yeah, that's a good question. The, the only uh, part that's difficult to wrestle with, uh, which I continually did, I, I think, throughout the whole book, is that there is something uh, – yeah, something real about the book itself. Uh, there are words on the page, there are sentences, there are discourses. And so there's a kind of sense of the reality of these words on the page. Um, there are various times in the life of the book where people read the words more closely. Mm -hmm. And so there are times when there are more sort of engaged or what I call realistic readings of the book. And there are times when people take more what we might say liberties or more imaginative approaches to the book. Uh, and there's a kind of dialectic. It goes back and forth. So that there's, a, there's a kind of realism in the book itself that continually makes its claim such that uh, when interpretations go too far away, there's, there's often a kind of pendulum swing uh, back to reading the book in a kind of realistic sense. So, that, so I would say there's a kind of... Uh, yeah, pendulum swing between realistic readings of the book and figural readings of the book. And, though, and that tension, that uh, dichotomy is part, I would say, of the life of the book. Okay, and we'll expand on that kind of as we go, because that gets at, at the heart of, of your overall interpretation, as I understand it. But before we do, let's talk for a second about why Genesis is even still around. I mean, this is a book that is very old, and it's still very a very important text in to many different cultures. So uh, Eric Auerbach, is that how you say that yes. scholar's name? Yes. So Eric yes. Auerbach, he's a great literary scholar. I was introduced to his work um, in grad school. He, he has this arresting description of Genesis to account for its ongoing relevance. I really like this. Even though the book, uh, the book tells stories, he says, but these stories are fraught with background. They're fraught with background. There are so many loose ends or unstated details or just assumption, unstated assumptions in these stories that the text virtually kind of begs readers to fill in the details, to mm -hmm. fill in the blanks. So what do you think about Auerbach's conclusions? Well, as, as you know, 
my book is based on what I call a kind of Auerbachian plot. That Auerbach's book, it's called Mimesis, the representation of reality in Western literature. And he begins with Genesis, and he also begins with uh, the Homeric epics, with the Odyssey, and compares the way that reality is represented in Genesis and in the Odyssey in their literary styles. Uh, and this, this, he makes an important point about Genesis having this uh, open weave quality that is fraught with background, and this backgrounded quality draws you in to fill in that background. So, it, so it, it's a book that requires you to interpret it. It's a book that draws you into it and, uh, in a sense, doesn't let go. This really is the template for my whole book. This is why the book uh, has been so central, centrally important and continues to be so, because it, it, it's a book that makes its claim on us. And it's, even its literary style does that. That's what this fraught with background quality is. Um, Auerbach also talks about how <clears throat> there is a kind of realism in the stylistic representation of reality in Genesis. It's a, it's a low style, he calls it. It's not a flowery style. It's simple. It's terse. Um, it's elusive. It's very much concerned with uh, ambiguities of character, of paradoxes of character, of the relationship between God and humans, which is never simple. It's always complicated, ambiguous, and, and, and it's part of that quality that draws you in. Uh, so he, he describes this realism, this psychological realism in Genesis as really one of the basic poles of uh, literary representation throughout uh, Western culture. So in this sense, the style and the conceptuality of Genesis undergirds all of Western literature since then. Uh, and so in a sense, when we're reading, for example, modern novels that present things in a realistic way and that, and that explore the ambiguities of character, um, the conflicts and uncertainties in human existence, human relationships, religion, and so forth, he would say that that all goes back to Genesis. Hmm. So in, in a very deep way, much of what we have in our culture, the way we think about things, the way we uh, represent things, really is rooted in Genesis. So in some very deep ways, uh, we are indebted to Genesis and we're dealing with Genesis uh, even where we don't realize that we are. So this is part of the life of Genesis. The life of Genesis is around us in places that we don't even think that it's there. And I think it also, that, that view kind of also accounts for the fact that there have been so many different interpretations of it, different readings of it. One of the quotes from the book here, you say that the ways that people perceive Genesis both shape and reflect their perception of reality. And you kind of mentioned that just a, a moment ago, this idea that the t that people are shaped by Genesis, but they also help shape Genesis the way that they read it by their own common assumptions in life. Is that is that accurate to say? Yeah, well, one can see that even in the world today. There are people who, for whom Genesis is their you know, charter, their constitution for understanding everything. There are people, let's say the um, radical atheists, who's, who, whose position, whose anti-religion position, is entirely constituted by uh, criticizing the book of Genesis. So they're still deeply engaged with the book of Genesis, even when they're rejecting it. Mm -hmm. So Genesis is still the conversation partner. Uh, and so this, you know, e even people who don't want it to be the conversation partner, it is the conversation partner. So Genesis is still shaping the way we think about things, and the way we think about things shapes the way we talk to and interpret the book of Genesis. Yeah, so, so it's, still, it's still so central in our cultural wars and things that are going on in Congress, things that are going on in the public schools. Uh, there's hardly a, a civic debate that we have today that the book of Genesis isn't in some ways one of the interlocutors. Yeah, so so different generations kind of bring their own concerns to the text, and then those concerns kind of help shape the the story that they get or the way that they read the story. That helps to account for this incredible range of different interpretations that Genesis has had that you uh, that you trace throughout the book. So the question is why 
why care about the past interpretations then if you know if, if every generation kind of brings its own concerns to the text and can play with the text or or learn from the text uh, so why dig up those past stories that other people have interpreted well if you're let me let me return to the metaphor of a biography if you're trying to understand the life of a person you know let's say you know George Washington was the first president of the United States but if you want to understand George Washington, you read a biography about him. The way that uh, he was shaped from his early life flows into his mature achievement. So I think similarly for when one is interpreting the book of Genesis, well, yeah, here's the point. When one is interpreting the book, in, in many ways, you're inevitably recapitulating ways of interpretation that have already been done. Hmm. So we're, again, we're influenced not only by the book of Genesis, but I think more importantly, we're also influenced by previous interpretations of the book of Genesis. So if we want to be aware of our relationship to this book, uh, you know, which you don't have to be aware of your relationship to this book, but if one wants to be uh, informed about your relationship to this book, then you have to go and look at the previous interpretations that are still circulating in one level or another and still influencing us. So scholarship, modern scholarship and biblical criticism can, can help help do that. Um, and oh, yeah. what I want to focus on here is that a lot of biblical criticism is intent on accessing the original life world in which the text was originally recorded or conceived of back in its original setting. That, that can help us get a grip on what the text was supposed to mean to its original recipients and how it was supposed to function in that culture. But the trouble seems to be that subsequent interpretations have sometimes stray from that original intent, sometimes d don't even remember anything about that original intent. Like it's, you know, was it supposed to be some sort of liturgy or was it supposed to be this a actual accurate history of how the world was created and this sort of thing? So how do you respond to, to that issue, given that, that your book focuses a lot on these subsequent interpretations? Uh, you, you, it seems to me that you find a lot of value in even in interpretations that stray from that original intent. Yes. Well, the and this is the dichotomy I've talked about: uh, what the words on the page actually say. And let me say, to to understand that, first of all, you have to understand the language that they're written in. And to understand, you know, biblical Hebrew, you have to understand a lot about the original culture, because words have meanings; they have nuances that uh, you know, a person from a different culture won't pick up unless you really learn the original language and the, the, the thought world in which those uh, words and sentences circulated. So the work of uh, historical scholarship is crucial if one wants to understand the words on the page, what they actually say um, in the most uh, detailed and, and uh, uh, reflective sense. Now, the task doesn't end there, however, because, as, I'm, as I've suggested, the impact of the book is not entirely uh, constituted by what it meant in Iron Age Israel. Clearly, the impact of the book uh, largely consists of how the book has had its life within Western civilization. So one, one wants to relate those two aspects to each other, what the words actually say and how those words themselves have been taken in different ways. But I, I want to suggest that you can't entirely escape the details of the text itself. Uh, so the, in this respect, the original intent continually comes back and asserts itself uh, because you know, this uh, interpreter or that interpreter will all of a sudden say, no, what you said is you know, ungrammatical. Uh, and so things like grammar, semantics, uh, allusions to other texts, even you know, ancient, ancient Near Eastern backgrounds, these things allow us to see how the text is, in a sense, exerting its force on us in the way that Auerbach talks about. So that never disappears. I mean, it, it can be... Uh, it can ebb and flow in different ways, but it never disappears. And so I think the historical scholarship is crucial 
uh, if one wants to understand the words on the page and how those words on the page continue to exert its force on us, even if someone is doing a very figural interpretation. So it's part of that ebb and flow, this, this uh, pendulum swing between, between realism and figuralism. The realism always is there. The tree always is there in the forest, even if no one's listening. Yeah, one of the, another quote from the book is you say that when, when readers try to go beyond the literal sense of the text, we may err, but sometimes splendidly. So you might err splendidly, yes. you say, yes. right? Can, yes. you, can you err like non-splendidly too? Oh, absolutely. And how, uh, how do you decide? Like what's a splendid error and what's a, what's a non? Well, okay, let me, let's just give some examples. Um, well, for example, hmm, platonic interpretation of the Bible uh, in, in the Greek period, this was begun by Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jewish scholar in Alexandria in the uh, first century AD, and was taken up into uh, Christian theology by people like Origen and other uh, uh, Christian uh, church fathers. Platonic interpretation is a way of, of kind of harmonizing the biblical stories with Greek philosophy. Uh, so, for example, well, let me let me put it this way: reinterpreting the idea of wisdom in the Book of Proverbs with the Greek term logos, which means wisdom, it means word, and it also takes on these mystical meanings about a kind of pre-existing spirit that it both is God and is not God. Well, you see those ideas flowing in the Gospel of John, in the prologue of the Gospel of John. So, this is not a correct interpretation of the of the Hebrew Bible concept of wisdom, but by linking the the biblical concept with the Platonic concept, and then linking this idea of wisdom back with uh, Genesis 1, you have a new uh, complicated concept that in its own way is, of course, magnificent. Okay. Let's. Um, I want to take a different bite at, of the apple here. Uh, now that we've laid this preliminary groundwork, so let's talk about the Genesis of Genesis a little more specifically. The beginning of the text. Most listeners uh, of the show are probably fairly familiar with the stories in Genesis, but they might be surprised at uh, you know all the things that are packed into this first book in the canon. They probably they might not remember. There's like creation, the Garden of Eden, the flood, the Ark, the Tower of Babel, the Call of Abraham. Jacob's son Joseph and his in his famous coat and and all these stories these are all packed into Genesis. There's so there's all these stories, but but what do scholars say about the origins of that of all these stories being kind of put together this way? Well, scholars have looked at the yeah how the Bible was put together, how the Bible was written. It's obviously a complicated text. Um, yeah. What we see is that, first of all, there are all sorts of traditions about creation and antiquity in ancient Near Eastern uh, religious traditions. And uh, some of these are drawn upon in the book of Genesis in various ways. The flood story, for example, we have old Babylonian versions of it in the Atrahasis myth and in the Gilgamesh epic. So in some cases, you can actually see an old story being transformed in one way or another. Uh, we have stories of um, creation uh, in Greek, uh, excuse me, in Mesopotamian and uh, Egyptian mythology, and also in Greek mythology. You have an initial state of chaos. It's often depicted as a watery, dark chaos, uh, and then the gods create uh, the universe out of these primordial materials. In Genesis 1, you see uh, a text that is drawing on these old concepts and rethinking them, uh, recrystallizing them in a kind of systematic way uh, that shows continuity with these older themes, but also transformations. For example, it's just a single God that's creating the universe, and he's creating the universe in almost a kind of material way, that God stands apart from uh, the universe and creates it uh, yeah, in the way that uh, uh, it's almost like the the uh, Enlightenment sense of God creating uh, an infinitely complex watch that, that continues to run and run and run. 
So that there's a new conception of creation and even a new conception of the world and nature that's in Genesis 1. And yet, at the same time, we see continuity, we see themes, motifs that are drawn upon from older Near Eastern materials. So there's a relationship <clears throat> in which the book of Genesis is born, again, going back to this uh, metaphor of, a, of the life, it's born in the kind of womb of the ancient Near East. Uh, but it's a unique uh, child, it's a unique individual. Secondly, we can tell that the book of Genesis w uh, consists of different written sources that have been secondarily edited together. And so some of the complexity of the book derives from the fact that uh, you know, this chapter was written by this person, and that chapter was written by a different person, and those two people didn't know each other, and in the present context, those two stories in Genesis don't seem to really know each other. Do you have an example of that? Like, how, how, what do scholars point to for, as an example of something that seems like two different stories sort of put together? Well, the, the prime example are the two creation stories. The creation story in Genesis 1 is this magnificent, you know, watch, divine watchmaker kind of idea. Uh, it says, let there be light, and there was light, and humans are created last as the pinnacle of creation, as the image of God who rule over all the other uh, animals on earth. And then you have the Garden of Eden story, which pretty much begins over again. It says, on the day that God created heaven and earth, it starts again, and it has a different order of creation. The man is created first. Adam is created first. Whereas in the first story, he was created last. And then the animals are created, and then Eve is created out of his rib. So you can see there's different sequence of events and even different concepts of uh, what humans are for. Uh, in the Garden of Eden story, Adam is created, uh, and he's put into the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. So essentially, he's created to be God's divine gardener. He's a, he's a working man. Uh, it's a pretty nice job to have to tend paradise, <laughs> uh, but then because of uh, certain transgressions that uh, he and his wife do, they're cast out of the garden, and then he has to be a normal farmer, which is a much harder job to do in, uh, in the semi-arid climate of the Middle East. So uh, even the concept of what humans are created to be is different in uh, the two creation stories. So they're different not only in details, but also in the conceptuality behind them. So with that in mind, when you're looking at Genesis in its original context, you can see, scholars can see um, influences that come from other cultures uh, at the time, and Genesis is sort of reshaping those and, and doing its own thing with, with, the, with those stories. And, and there are multiple stories by multiple authors. Right, and you, and you see these you see these put together. Now, how did the text then function? Like, why was it written then originally? How did it function in that original culture? Is it fair to say that the way that it would be read and or understood or listened to probably in that original context would be like a realism type of a reading? Like, did they think that this yes. was an actual history of like God really did it in these ways? Yeah, I think we have to think that people heard these stories as authoritative stories about the past, that this is how the world came into being. Now, let me say that get, that gets complicated when you put these different stories together. So if you have two stories of the creation of the world, well, which one is true and which one isn't? And so just by juxtaposing those stories, you, you essentially have to interpret them in a way that they can be harmonious. So this is part of the way that the, the very birth of the book itself uh, creates this requirement of interpretation, and really of intense interpretation, so that you can see the two creation stories as complementary. So you can see, for example, the Garden of Eden story as a, a flashback onto day six of creation, which is the standard approach uh, in most uh, uh, early interpreters. Uh, and yet, there are other interpretations that are stimulated by this, too. For example, I mentioned Philo of Alexandria. He's integrating Genesis with his understanding of uh, Greek philosophy. And so he says that the, the humans created in the Genesis 1 story, who are made in the image of God, are different 
then Adam, Adam and Eve in the second story who, who are created, well, he's created from, the, from the, uh, the dust of the soil and then she's created from his rib. He says those are two different entities. He says the first uh, humans created in the, in the image of God are ideal forms of mm -hmm. humans that live in this uh, invisible, higher spiritual world. And that then God creates Adam out of earthly substance. So that's the material Adam, who is a, a kind of earthly material manifestation of this uh, ideal concept of what humans are that was created in Genesis 1. So we have the ideal human and the material human. And this, this exemplifies the kind of platonic duality where ideas and concepts all have a, a, an, an invisible, absolute, timeless form in an unseen higher world, and then a, a, a transitory material manifestation uh, on Earth. So the complexity of the story stimulates him in a way that uh, creates a harmony uh, between the stories, between the, the tensions between the stories, but he solves it by integrating this platonic, this dualistic platonic philosophy with it. Yeah, and you point out in the book that that those sort of tensions were detected even even earlier than Philo. What first of all, what about around when was Philo doing his interpretations? He's first century A.D. Okay, so you point out that actually Genesis sort of enters the public domain from the beginning, especially once it was compiled, as as being in need of interpretation. The the yes, Old Testament. Yes itself it shows this in nehemiah right yes so when ezra comes back from uh, babylonian exile and it says that he brings the the book of the torah of moses with him and he he sets up shop in uh, jerusalem the people gather in the square and he reads this to them all day long and they haven't heard it before and they cry they're so moved by hearing this book uh, but it also says that uh, around him were helpers who were interpreting the book for the audience. Now, we're not really sure what that means. It could mean that they're actually translating it into Aramaic, which, which might have been the vernacular tongue of the people at the time, and they couldn't understand biblical Hebrew. But it also could mean that they're both translating and explaining, filling in the gaps, as it were. So in one way or another, uh, interpretation accompanies the life of the Bible from its very public uh, publishing, from its public uh, coming into being. You then you talk about these four assumptions that, that sort of grew up around the text uh, of the Hebrew Bible, these four assumptions that, that the text is cryptic, relevant, perfect, and divine. Can you talk about how those bear on people's reading of, of Genesis? Yeah, this is something that I draw from uh, James Kugel and his wonderful book, uh, The Bible As It Was. Uh, he talks about how, yeah, in the latter part of the Second Temple period, in you know, early classical Judaism, in early Christianity, people are already reading the Bible with these, with these assumptions built in that the book is, yeah, as you said, perfect, cryptic, divine, uh, relevant, this, these are some of the things that drive these interpretations. For example, why would you think that the Bible is cryptic? Well, one of the reasons that you would think that is because if you read it closely, there are these frictions, there are these seeming conflicts between stories, uh, and there are also lots of unanswered obscurities uh, in each of the in many of the stories themselves, I mean, some of, some of these are simply odd grammatical forms that were forgotten and, and uh, regarded as strange in a later period. Uh, so, for all sorts of reasons, there are un, uh, there are obscurities in the book, and so the idea developed that these obscurities, these seeming contradictions, these seeming tensions are themselves a kind of red flag that says there are obscure cryptic meanings hidden here, and it's the job of the interpreter to dive in and explore those cryptic hidden meanings, which then make sense of things in the text that otherwise don't make sense. So this is a very 
powerful form of interpretation. And essentially, it's a way of saying that the book makes sense, even in places where it doesn't. So, for example, uh, for Philo of Alexandria, when he reads that God planted a garden in Eden, he says, no, that can't possibly be true. Because for his concept of God, omniscient, omnipresent, abstract, this is a God who doesn't get his hands dirty mm -hmm. and, plant, and plant a garden. Uh, he says this is an anthropomorphic uh, depiction of God that's not true. So that means he has to dig deeper and say, well, then what does this signify? If, if it's not true that God actually plants gardens or, let's say, has emotions or walks around in the garden in the late afternoon, if those things can't be true, then what is true? So he has to look at those things and interpret them in a figural, in an imaginative, in a platonic way to find the deeper truth that is hidden there. So this so is the sense, rise of like figural reading of the so text. So this is the rise of figural reading of the text. And in a sense, it's a way of making the sense consistently true, profound, uh, educational, uh, inspirational, and relevant for the present. By, by saying that where it seems odd or difficult, there's deeper hidden meanings there that, that make this difficult text, in fact, even more profound than the stuff around it. So earlier you mentioned the, the way that Platonic thought um, sort of shifted the un people's understanding of Genesis. This, this is when people brought Platonic ideas to the text and for example, I think Philo would, would count in there, right, where he read these two different creation stories as one depicting a more creation in the ideal realm, right, and then mm -hmm, a more, mm -hmm. like, solid creation. So he's bringing, you know, Plato into the book, and that affects the way the text has been read since then. There's another context that you point to that arose, the apocalyptic context that, right. that, that was brought to the text. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, this is a hugely important point of view that also arises towards the uh, latter part of the Second Temple period, where people start reading the Bible, again, as a cryptic text, uh, but for the apocalyptic readers, the, the hidden quality is not so much about higher philosophical truths as it would be for a, for a platonic reader, but the hidden meaning is about the future and about the end of days. The rise of apocalyptic interpretation has to do with the wider, uh, this wider growth of this worldview where the obscure things in the Bible are cryptic. But in this, uh, in this respect, the hidden meanings are not so much about higher philosophical realities, but really are uh, cryptic signs or foreshadowings that point to the future, that point toward the end of time. Uh, the redemption, the Messiah, and so forth. So if, uh, an example, of course, would be in the New Testament, in the book of, in the Gospel of Matthew, where he's consistently reading things in the uh, Old Testament as foreshadowings of uh, the coming of Christ. So there's a way in which this key of reading the Old Testament as a, as a repository of secrets about the end of time this becomes a very strong uh, method of interpretation, and it's, and it's applied to Genesis as well. For example, the picture of paradise is reinterpreted as not just something that happened at the beginning of time, but also a glimpse of what the uh, existence at the end of time will be like, that we'll be going back to the Garden of Eden, we'll be going back to paradise. And these images of, of the future Garden of Eden, where the righteous will go, at the time of the Great Judgment. We see these, uh, these ideas already in the 3rd century BC in the Book of Enoch, uh, which is one of the most influential books that nobody knows about because it didn't make it into the Bible. Uh, it's, it's, these ideas are very strongly in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, where the, uh, the group's teacher, the, the, called the Teacher of Righteousness, he, he's said to be the one to whom God told the secrets that are there in the books of the Bible. So that you, you have a, an inspired interpreter who can interpret what those secrets are in the biblical text. And those secrets end up being about the end time, 
the time of the great redemption, the war between the children of light and the children of darkness, the coming of the Messiah, and so forth. And so this will bring back a, a return to paradise. And so those are the, the kinds of ways that Genesis flows into this uh, apocalyptic mysteries. So you kind of have the early text is interpreted in a realist fashion. You have the rise of figural interpretations where Genesis is mingled with Platonic philosophy, with apocalyptic views of history. And then you trace a shift back toward a more literal reading. This is around the 5th yes. century with Augustine, right? Well, Augustine, yeah, Augustine was one of the great uh, thinkers in uh, Christian tradition. Um, he wanted to have the best of both worlds. He wanted to say, yes, it's figural, yes, it's, uh, it's telling the story of the city of God in this uh, platonic world up above, while we live in the city of man below. Uh, but he wanted it to be both. He wanted to, to have a kind of platonic meaning, a higher meaning, but he also wanted it to be historically true. So he said you can't separate those two. And so he developed the idea that the stories are all historically accurate, that you know God did plant a garden. But at the same time, those historical events themselves have a figural content. So that reality itself... The events that are that are told in the Bible have a figural meaning, and so they're not just historical. They're not just actual events or actual creatures, but every you know every event, every tree, every rock uh, has higher spiritual meanings to it. So he kind of combines the figural and the realistic interpretation in a very interesting kind of synthesis where they both signify each other. Now, the, the, the real return to realism, I would say, occurs in Judaism with uh, Rashi, who's a really important uh, medieval interpreter. That's around the 12th century, right? That's in the 12th century. And he said, I have to read the text in very closely and understand the text in its context. You know, so the meaning of a word or a sentence has to be constrained by the larger paragraphs or the larger stories that it's in. And so he did a critique of a traditional rabbinic interpretation. He said there's lots of wisdom in there, there's lots of sermons, but only some of the traditional rabbinic interpretations actually relate to the to this plain sense of the text. So his idea was that you had to read the plain sense of the text in a realistic way, and only then can you jump off and do these other uh, figural exercises, but he says those are just embroidery. Uh, they're not the real uh, essential meaning. So he's separating the figural from the uh, plain sense of the words themselves. He was also very influenced by um, Jewish grammarians uh, who were really understanding the working of, of Hebrew grammar much more concretely. So it's a much closer reading of the text. Now, his influence flows directly to Martin Luther. So Martin Luther takes this to the next step. This he is like said, the 16th century, then. This is in the 16th century. So this is the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And he took this idea and he made it a, a very powerful um, tool in the Protestant Reformation itself. He says all of these figural interpretations, particularly these allegorical interpretations, he says they're a bunch of hooey. <laughs> and he says, quite nicely, he says the Catholic Church promulgates these figural interpretations in order to justify their own power. And I think own, hooey was like a direct power. quote, right? Like that was the actual. Oh, he was a, he was a <laughs> hilarious guy. He says, I, when I, he says, when I was a monk, I used to do allegorical interpretations. I could do an allegorical interpretation of a piss pot, he said. <laughs> So he's, but when he had his you know, awakening and decided to do this uh, Protestant Reformation, he said the figural interpretation is just a con job by the, by the Catholic Church. So he saw he a said, method of interpretation as being a means by which um, religion could sort of constrain or the lives of individual believers kind of a thing? Exactly. So he's seeing it in a way of, of, of uh, manifesting the power of the Church, that these uh, these imaginative interpretations, he said, are just a con job 
by the church to manipulate people, to ex impose their power of interpretation and their political and economic authority onto people. And he used this then as a wedge to say that, first of all, if these figural interpretations are a bunch of hooey, then therefore you don't need a church hierarchy. You don't need a pope. You don't need priests. You don't need uh, cardinals. Every believer can uh, be his own priest. Every believer can read the Bible on their own and understand the plain sense of the Bible. So he's taking this language of the plain sense of the Bible and saying this is the real sense, and it's the sense that anyone individually can read and understand. And the message of salvation is simple. So, so one he of uses the this things, as a weapon against the against the Catholic Church, and it, and it was his most powerful weapon. So looking at those four assumptions that Kugel talked about, the, one of the chief ones that Martin Luther seemed to be going after then was the cryptic one. He's saying, right. yeah. So so, but when you start questioning those original ways of reading, cryptic, relevant, perfect, divine, you know, they all kind of come up for grabs at that point, right? When you start yes. poking at any one of them, you could start poking at any number of them, right? And that's sort of what the 16th and 17th centuries sort of bring in, which you, you trace out. One of them was really interesting is you locate parody, uh, yes. parodies of Genesis appear around this time, right? Yes. So you have someone like Rabelais, who's a Catholic, uh, a very learned Catholic humanist. Uh, uh, he was a monk. Um, and yet he, yeah, he, he, as a learned man, well, part of the Renaissance is going back to the sources and, once, and learning the original languages. And this also flows into Martin Luther's critique of, uh, of fig figural interpretation. That when you, re when you read the Hebrew or Greek original, a lot of these elaborate interpretations do seem like they're not really resting on any foundation. So Rabelais wrote this hilarious book about Gargantua and Pantagruel, and he makes fun of learned priests prattling on about the Bible. And he makes fun of the Bible itself, which is a very strange attitude. He says in the beginning of his book, he says, this book itself is a figural interpretation and should be, should be read in a figural way. And in his, in his preface, he's actually making fun of people who do that. So he's, he's, it's one of the funniest books ever written, and one of the things he makes fun of is the pretensions of priests, and uh, he makes fun of some of the stories in the Bible. But he does it so effectively that you can't help but laugh with him. And he was actually a favorite of some of the popes, because he was just so hilarious. So the old ways of interpretation become an object of humor. And this is one of the ways that shows that these old ways don't really have legs anymore. Yeah. You know, when someone is, is, is fodder for the comics on TV nowadays, you know that they don't have much to stand on. And this happened with various types of biblical interpretation in this period. And we also see the rise here of, of new scientific worldviews which uh, that, that challenged the, the account of the world's creation and, and of nature. So um, what are some so, of the ways that modern science played into the life of Genesis? Well, it, this period of the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment, the Protestant Reformation, this is also the time of the rise of science. And all of these things are connected with each other. Having a more realistic view of the Bible and reading it for its plain sense in a kind of detailed, patient, um, you know, quasi-scientific way is also how people are reading nature at this time. And so at this time, people are saying, well, you know, rocks and trees and flowers don't have extra spiritual qualities. They're just natural things. Uh, there's a kind of demystifying of various aspects of, of everyday life. There's cri critique of magic, of astrology, of things like that. So there's a sense in which there's a kind of rising realism uh, in, in many avenues of thought. And so when you have someone like Galileo, he takes this, someone else invented the telescope, he made a better one, and then he had the clever idea of pointing it up at night, and all of a sudden he sees the moon, you know, and the moon is not a perfect object anymore. It's got like holes in it. It's got craters. And then he looks up at, the, at Jupiter and he sees there's moons going around Jupiter. 
Now, these are real details that he's seeing that no one had seen before, and they have real implications for our understanding of reality. For example, if there's moons orbiting Jupiter, that means that not everything revolves around the Earth. As is depicted in Genesis, right? As is depicted, well... Well, Genesis, I guess they don't touch on that, but Genesis does have the Earth sort of in the middle, in the center, and then there's this like firmament up above yes, where there's like water yes. and... So, so the picture that we have in Genesis 1 is that... The, it's like a snow the, globe. The, yeah, the firmament, that word really explains what the Hebrew says. It's something that's firm. It's a solid body. And so it is like a snow globe or like a, a dome stadium. And God sets the sun and moon and the stars in this firm uh, uh, firmament, yeah, in this dome in the sky. So it is essentially you know, a, a geocentric picture where the sun and the moon and the stars are set in the sky and they revolve around us. And there are other things in the Bible that talk about the sun coming up and then going down and then returning back to where it started again. So this is the normal picture. You know, before Galileo, this was what everybody believed. And I still actually believe it myself because I see the sun come up in the east <laughs> and it goes down in the west and then it goes somewhere and then it comes back in the east the next day. So this is the, the world of human perception yeah. that is depicted. And without you know, a telescope and someone as smart as Galileo and Copernicus, you, you, you couldn't figure out otherwise. But you talk so the, about his, the idea of accommodation, right? Like Galileo yes. didn't throw the Bible. What's interesting about Galileo is he, he wasn't this guy who discovered science and then said, well, you know, get rid of this. I don't need this Bible. I don't need religion. I mean, he had a run in obviously with the Catholic Church at the time, but he maintained a certain regard for the Bible. And you talk about accommodation as the way. Yes. What, what is that? Yes. Well, there's two things that Galileo, first of all, Galileo was a pious Catholic. And he had no uh, concept that he was undermining anything. He held to the older ideas of Augustine that, you know, science and uh, uh, the Bible can't contradict each other because they're both true. If there's a seeming contradiction, then you have to interpret the Bible in a figural way, in a cryptic way. So Galileo is actually a more traditional figure in uh, Christian interpretation uh, than, the, the, than his inquisitors were on the, on the uh, Catholic uh, Inquisition that uh, found him guilty of uh, suspicion of heresy. So he was accommodating the Bible with, um, with science by saying that we should read the Bible in this figurative way. Um, and it was the church that was saying, no, you have to read, it for, you have to read the Bible for the plain sense. So they essentially had been convinced that what Martin Luther was saying was right. So you have to read the Bible for the plain sense. And the plain sense of the Bible does seem to depict a geocentric universe. Uh, so they said, here science does conflict with the Bible, and therefore science is wrong. So they really set up the, the, the structure, the template for modern fundamentalism. Right. And let's let's go on to that. And so in the nineteenth okay. century you have okay. you have the rise of fundamentalism. There are some theologians from Princeton Seminary who want to defend the Bible as being fully literal. They they yeah. say all the affirmations uh, of a scientific nature in the Bible are to be construed as literally true and this sort of thing. And you know, George Mars uh, George Marsden has said mm -hmm. that these type of thinkers seem to be anti modern in the sense that they sort of reject scientific perspectives, but he also says, in some respects, they're strikingly modern. Yes. What's he referring to there? Oh, and, he, and he's absolutely right. What, what we see modern fundamentalism in, in America as it's formed in the late 1800s, and these people at Princeton Theological Seminary were sort of the intellectual leaders of this movement, um, they are reacting to the problems raised by modernity. And so, in a, in a very strong sense, they are one of the phenomena of modernity, insofar as they're reacting against it. But interestingly, the way they're re reacting against the validity of science, let's say, uh, it started out being that the problem was geology. Mm -hmm. and then the, the age of the earth, right? The so age the, of the it's earth. It's older than, than the 6,000 years that Usher sort of established. Right. And, yeah. Right, right. So, if the, if the 
Earth is millions of years old and the universe is billions of years old, then, you know, there seems to be a, con a con contradiction there. And then it becomes uh, astronomy is a problem, and then finally biology is a problem with Darwin. Mm -hmm. So if people are descended from monkeys, then Genesis 1 can't be true. Or if, if any species change, if, if species themselves evolve, then this account of creation in Genesis 1 it contradicts that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but particularly, it, it, the rubber hits the road with the creation of humans. Uh, if humans evolve from other species, then we're not created, you know, on day six in the image of God and so forth. Um, but the, one, of the, one of the things that uh, these uh, critics of modern science, these early fundamentalists are doing, is they're thinking in a very scientific way. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is that the Bible is a series of scientific propositions. And these propositions are necessarily correct. And the way they talk about it is the way that a scientist talks about data. Yeah. So the way they're thinking is a very, very modern scientific mode of thought, but they're using this scientific thought by, you know, they end up saying the Bible is more scientific than science. So science is wrong. Because science is just opinions and theories and so forth, but the Bible is really systematic science. So this is a, this is a way that we can see that, the, that fundamentalism is a, is a distinctively modern phenomenon. Augustine wasn't talking in this way. Martin Luther wasn't talking in this way. So they're talking in a scientific way about the Bible as being truer than science, but their whole idiom is distinctively modern. And it's and, and that's just one of these, again, another way of reading Genesis, like we talked about yes, at the beginning, yes. the assumptions that the readers bring to the text can shape the text as much as the readers think the text shapes their lives. It's like exactly. this reciprocal exactly. relationship. It's a circle, it's an interpretive or hermeneutic circle that we're always embedded in. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a modernist, So so this is paradoxical, but fundamentalism is fundamentally a modern phenomenon which they i think a lot of fundamentalists would say what like they're they believe they're sort of countering the ill effects of modernism right like right. pushing right. back but they actually buy into all those assumptions in they the buy, way they frame it exactly exactly yeah. and yeah. so it's ironic it's a very ironic thing and when you see the history of it it just shows you how you know people don't really realize the how they're being influenced by past categories that they take as timelessly true, but these categories are actually very recent categories yeah. of thinking. So one example that I'll zoom in on is like, let's take Noah's Ark, for example. The, it's this story that seems to depict this flood. People assume it's global. People search for evidence for that. And how about, I, I'm interested about how within Judaism, you have, you have a Jewish background uh, of sorts. I'm interested in how Jews today read the text, and I assume that there's many different ways of reading that story. Do they, do, do a lot of uh, practicing Jews believe that there was like a historical event where the entire earth was flooded, or do they read it more figuratively? What's the general sense there? Well, in Judaism, there is really as broad a range of interpretations of something like the flood story as there is in Christianity. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are Jewish fundamentalists that would be completely on board with, um, uh, who am I thinking of? You know, anybody who's on the far right of uh, fundamentalist Christianity t today, Jerry Falwell, for example. Ken Ham or something? Yeah, Ken Ham, Jerry Falwell, uh, all those people. There are ultra-Orthodox Jews that take every word of the Bible as, as true in, in a historical sense. But they tend also to read it uh, in various kind of mystical and figurative senses as well. Mm -hmm. So they tend... To, in some ways, they're almost more like Augustine, where they see it as historically true, but also with cryptic spiritual meanings. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, just a wide range. The mainstream Jewish synagogues have the same range as the mainstream Jew, uh, Christian churches. And then there's very liberal and secular uh, Jewish communities that read it as literature um, or as you know, the, the works of an ancient culture that don't have any relevance for us today. 
So there's just a, a massive range of mm. uh, uh, diversity of opinion in Judaism that really mirrors the diversity of uh, views in Christianity. So that takes us back then to, to a main question I, I hope that we kind of explored throughout the episode, and that's why, why read Genesis today? And, and you write mm. that people today can read Genesis passionately and critically, even with their contemporary understanding of science and of the world. You write that Genesis is a magnificent work of religious literature, which mm. still has the capacity to inspire. So what's your advice to readers of Genesis today? Well, I would say that, in a sense, we're all readers of Genesis, whether we know it or not. And so, in some respects, to, to be aware of that is to be more self-aware. And that there, in the life of the book of Genesis, it has uh, been taken in many different ways. What I tell to my students is that we want to read the text very closely. Because, and this goes back to uh, what you were talking about with Eric Auerbach, that it really is a magnificent piece of writing. And to uh, really read it closely and understanding the nuances of the text itself is to be inspired by what really is a magnificent work of, uh, of what I would say human thought, okay, as a secular person. But uh, it is thought that not only is the, uh, a magnificent work of religious literature from an ancient culture, but it's still part of us. So, it, so whether we acknowledge it or not, it informs our concepts of ourself, our concepts of the universe, our concept of what reality is about. So in that respect, our concept of reality and our reading of the book of Genesis are still related to each other. So in a sense, just becoming aware of that makes you a more self-aware person. And you kind of talk about yourself as a secular person that sort of approaches the text in that way. As you teach the text to students, have you found uh, students who are re more religiously inclined to be unsettled by the types of things that you talk about as you teach the text of Genesis? Or do you, do you have ways of, of engaging with people who maybe take a more literal reading of Genesis uh, or, you know, what, what kind of negotiations go on in the classroom as yes. you have a mix of people who are secular, a mix of people who are religiously devout and, and anywhere in between. Yeah. Well, this is one of the very interesting things about teaching the Bible is that, uh, you know, people have strong feelings about it in all sorts of different ways. But I think that people tend to be receptive to the idea of reading the text closely. That if you, if you respect the book, you know, if you take the course, it means you're interested at some level in reading the text and understanding it. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're looking at the text, looking at its nuances, and looking at how it really is magnificent work of, of uh, writing, uh, that engages people no matter where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And so we have, you know, very productive discussions and, uh, you know, exciting explorations of this material. And, you know, people come from different places. But when you explore the intricacies of this text in a detailed, focused way, that has its own reality and it has its own reward. And so, uh, you know, it raises questions for uh, devout people but those questions are questions that should be raised. And it, it, it makes people more sophisticated religious thinkers. One more quick question in tandem with that. Do you have a preferred translation of it, especially that sort of draws out the, the literary qualities? Do you have one that you recommend? Yeah, when I'm, when I'm just teaching the book of Genesis, I always use Robert Alter's translation. It's, it's by far the best English translation, and also in his footnotes, he brings out some of the nuances that you can't really reproduce in translation. But that's the kind of model of reading the text very closely for its literary texture. This is what Alter is mm -hmm. able to do in his translation. And this just shows you the nuances, the subtleties, the complications that... You know, in a sense, saying that it's literature doesn't mean that it's anti-religious. It doesn't mean that this is an anti-religious way of reading. Right. It's simply a way of reading to understand the book at a deeper level. 
and then you can do with that what you wish. Yeah, you'll notice different details than you'd noticed before. You'll notice instances of plot and characterization and setting and mood and and conflict. Yeah, and the deeper conceptuality behind the stories is all carried by the details. This all goes back to what you were talking about with Auerbach, that it's a very tersely written text, mm -hmm. and it's fraught with background. Mm -hmm. And so to, to see what that background is and how you're being guided to see these complications, these ambiguities, these conceptual problems, the text is really doing that. Uh, and uh, it draws you in, as, as Auerbach says, and doesn't let you go. And this is the magic of the book. That's Dr. Ronald Hendel. He's the Norma and Sam Dabby Professor of Hebrew Bible and Jewish Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of a book from Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Book Series. It's the biography of the book of Genesis. And he's also working on a critical edition of the Hebrew Bible with the Society for uh, for Biblical Literature. Thanks a lot for joining us today. My pleasure.